Jim Dwyer is going to do the introduction, but I got to tell a little story about it. Okay, my speaker today, I have uh, heard uh, before, as did Dan, when he spoke to our Rotary Club. We thought to ourselves, this is going to be something to put you to sleep after lunch. This was such an excellent talk, we both immediately thought it would be great to have him come over and speak with us. This is Dr. Joe Sterling. He is a professor of science, uh, soil science, over at St. John's, St. Ben's. And uh, he actually is the son of a butcher family that owns butcher shop down in uh, Daw Dawson. And uh, his wife is from this area, though. Know, and uh, he uh, decided he absolutely did not want to do anything with butchering if he could help it and got a science degree instead. <laughs> so he's going to talk about the area here and, and uh, also show you his map where you can talk and find your own property. And um, we uh, found this so interesting that we hope you would enjoy it and that we have a good discussion of it. So, you want to tell your story first? Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. So, then we'll walk to Dr. Joe Sterling. Go. Well, you all know about um, Father Piers and how he, you know, got a lot of people to settle in this area. Well, if you were writing real convincing letters back home to come to the Black Hills or even the Badlands, uh, how successful or how fancy a letter would he have to write to convince some people to come over from Germany or Russia, wherever, right? Well, um, Joe is going to tell us about why Father Piers was so convincing about why to come here. Um, a related story, I was riding a train from Baltic Sea to Berlin, and uh, if you would have just plunked me down on a train and said, guess where you're at, I could have guessed northeastern Germany or Stearns County. Um, yeah, there were small farm fields, there were lakes, there were deer stands. <laughs> I mean, so, anyhow, please greet Joel. I might take this so I can, uh, I'm a little taller and then I've got to work my slideshow over here. And I've been told by uh, Steve Pennick to watch out with this crowd, you get so fired up that sparks have literally flown in past meetings, if that's correct. Some of you were here a few years ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. sparks literally flew, so I better watch out. Try to contain yourselves now, right, as we, as we move forward. So, yep, yeah, as Jim mentioned, I'm a soil scientist. Um, I grew up in southwestern Minnesota in Dawson, as he mentioned, and uh, soils are something that really called to me, and I went into the environmental science field, and a lot of these problems in the environmental world have a root back in soils, and that's why I kind of drew, was always driven to learn more and more about soils. And just about everybody can relate to soils. You don't think about soils, but I think most people can relate to them because you're walking on them, or you're mowing the lawn, or you're out walking around, you know, doing something with soil almost on a daily basis. And so I'm going to highlight some things here. I'm, I'm not sure if many people realize we've got some pretty interesting soils in Stearns County. It, it's actually abnormal compared to the rest of the state. We've got a lot of different types of soils. Those of you that know this county, growing from east to west, you get a range in cropping systems and a range of soils. Um, and so I'm going to share some of the science background first. Again, history related to natural resources and why we have such odd soils. But then I want to look at more on the human side of things and that, to you know the history of those first settlers that came here. How did they interact with this landscape? What were, what were they doing? How did they work these lands? And why did they come here? Um, and things like that. So, I hope you enjoy this, yeah. Let's see if I can advance my slide. There we go. All right, pop quiz time. What is soil, right? All right, so i just give you a brief description. You know, soil is this dynamic natural body, meaning it changes, it's dynamic. It doesn't say static. Soil changes over time. You, you don't think it changes, but actually over geologic time, soils are always changing. Now in your lifetime, in my lifetime, they're not going to change too much, but they always are. And they've got this mineral stuff in it, and they've got this organic stuff in it, and living things. And they're supporting all that life in the landscape we see in the plants that grow out there. If you want to break it down, if I had a box of soil and I tried to put it in a pie chart, well, what is soil? 
Well, soil is about half of actual mass, about half of its mass, and then the other half is simply void space in soil. That's the definition of soil. You got in that percent, maybe about 25% air, 25% water. The mass is what we consider the mineral fraction. The big chart of that over there you can see is 45%. That's your sand, silt, and clay. Those are the little particles. They once started as a rock, and I'll be talking about this in a little bit, a rock or stone somewhere, and they've been worn down over many, many, many years into little particles we call sand, silt, and clay. That's mineral fraction. And then you've got this little sliver that's really important off to the side as well, that's organic material. So that's living things, but it's also that dead, decomposing stuff in the soil that really gives life to the soil itself, helps feed your plants as it decomposes, helps feed all the life in the soil. So that's kind of a way to think about what soil is when I talk about it. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in soil, except the one thing I wanted to give you is, why are our soils so different? Why is my neighbor's soil different than my soil? Why is it sandy and gravelly at the top of this hill and then all clay down here? Why is that? That's, what, that's one piece I want to share today, and it goes into why Stearns County has such unique soils across the landscape. We call these the five soil forming factors. So there's, think about a recipe card, and if I'm going to make up, mix up soil and give you a certain type of soil, I can tweak each one of these to give different types of soil. So I'm going to hit on each of these organisms, topography, climate, parent material, and time. So the parent material, the easiest thing, that, again, this is that rock. This is a mineral fraction. Again, all soils start as some sort of rock or stone material that are brought in. So it weathers down over thousands and thousands of years into smaller and smaller particles. Um, different, there's different types of parent material. Um, terms that are used, we, we talk about in Minnesota, we have glaciers that came here. I'm going to talk about that in a second. We have things called glacial till as a type of parent material. This is that stuff that's been crushed down under the intense pressure and scoured across the landscape into teeny tiny particles. So this is a lot of clays and silts tend to be glacial till. And then we've got something here in the Avon Hills area, close to Cold Spring, which is more glacial outwash. That's when these big glaciers started to melt and recede. They, they formed these massive lakes and then those lakes emptied and they emptied into rivers and streams that spread out across our landscape and into it, they had all these stones and sediments that were washed out. It was just like a sandy outwash of a stream. That's something on a huge scale where these glaciers were. That's what gives way to that sandy, coarse material we have all throughout the Avon Hills and all throughout Strange County today. I want to highlight a little bit about if you walk outside in Stearns County and you look at the ground, how did that ground here, when, when, when did the soil arrive or what, what really formed the soil? I'm not going to spend too much time going back to the old glaciation, but I want to talk about the most recent glaciation period. That gave way to the soils you see today on the landscape. That's the, up in that Wisconsin era, about 75,000 years ago. Um, we had one lobe, the superior lobe of a glacier, come in from Lake Superior, as you could guess, with the name. Lake Superior coming in from the east. So if you live in the eastern third of Sturds County, right, right where you here, actually I'll show you a map in a second, you have sediment that was deposited by that superior lobe coming from one direction from the northeast up towards our area, down towards our area to the south here, and then it receded back. Right about the time it was receding back came this other big massive lobe from the other side, this one came from the west. This is known as the Des Moines lobe that came down, as you could guess, all the way down to Des Moines, Iowa. But at one point it has a structure that thumbs out to the side here in Stearns County and came right up to about Avon and Cold Spring here area. And I'll show you where that is. But that's the western two thirds of Stearns County. If you're in there, you've got sediment that's left behind by that Des Moines lobe. If you're in the eastern third, you've got sediment from the Superior lobe. And they're different. That's why so that's one factor right already. Different stuff came from Lake Superior than came from out west of here. Um, so the Superior stuff tends to be more acidic, a little bit coarser, more tills in the Des Moines lobe, and a little bit less acidic, more calcareous, or higher pH. Here's a visual just to give you that massive Laurentide ice sheet that was up here in the last Wisconsin glaciation. Covered all of Canada up there, and, and there's those lobes, there's Minnesota down there. You can see the direction of those lobes as they protruded down across our, our state and where they came. And then I've got a shot of kind of where they're receding. So I've got this little elevation map is here. I've got landmarks for you. There's Long Prairie up there. You can make that out of Melrose. Let's see if my clicker works. No? Okay. St. John's University, if you can see it on the map, and down towards the bottom is Kimball. You can see the arrows depict that's the extent is how far west that superior lobe came. And look what it formed right there. That's called the St. Croix Moraine. So those Avon Hills that you see and we live in in our landscape, that's the, that's the big bulldozer action of that, that superior lobe coming down, forcing that land up, 
and ripping up and causing these big moraines, these big landscape moraines across there. That's what the Superior Lobe was kind of left behind. Now the other one I want to show the Des Moines Lobe, I can show you how far in that came. Just about to the extent, almost the same area roughly as the Superior Lobe, up just, uh, just west of uh, Albany, and you go down through this area. We're right here in Cold Spring, we're kind of at the intersection of these two uh, lobes because the Des Moines came in later, it stopped not too far west from here, just on the Chain Lakes and then it receded back at one point. So that's, that's the parent material now. Now we're gonna, I'm gonna spend a quick time climbing. I think everybody understands our, another forming factor it gives way to different soils. As you know, in Minnesota, we're drier in the west and wetter in the east, and it kind of has a gradient from the north to south as well. Um, but that's, that's a precipitation regime we've had for, it changes a little bit over time, that's a general one we have. You also know it's cold in the north and warmer in the south, right? The other one you might not know as much about, vegetation plays a dominant role on soils. And I always, I'm a master gardener and I do a lot of soils talks on that. I always tell master gardeners, soils and plants are kind of like a yin and yang. They play off each other quite a bit. And over time before humans were here, we had lots of vegetation in the landscape. And we weren't managing it or anything, but it gave way to the soils. It influenced the soils themselves, just like the soils influence the plants that grow above ground. And so a classic example is here in Minnesota, our, actually our state soil order is a mollusol. So a mollusol, which we have in Stearns County, a type of soil, is this really rich, deep black soil, characteristic of things you would find under that prairie vegetation. Those prairie roots go down deep into the ground and they deposit organic matter and dead roots every year, and so they build up this really rich topsoil. And that's a mollusol, that's one type of soil. Another type of soil that's different we have here in Stearns County is an alpha soil. So this is just vegetation influencing the type of soil. Alpha soils you're gonna find in a forest. Looks different. It looks different on the landscape because that it doesn't have quite as much rich organic matter as deep in the soil. It does have a nice rich organic matter, but it's shallow. It stays towards the top. Topsoil layer is not as deep. And that's because these are deciduous forests around this area. And every fall, you've got leaf material that drops off those leaves, goes down to the ground, and decomposes. So you find that that organic matter layer in the forest is concentrated to the top, not as deep as on the prairies. So that's, that's an example of how vegetation really plays into the differences in the soils we have across the landscape. And you can see, if you're familiar with this, the old Stearns County uh, Land Survey back in the, from the 1850s, you can see I, I grouped these to make them less complex. You've got groups of forests there in the dark green and the grays. You've got that savanna because we were that transition zone between the prairie com coming over to the forested areas. So we have lots of savannas and the oranges and browns. And then if you pick out the bright yellows there and little strips of of pinks and kind of salmon-y color there, that's that prairie vegetation. So even here, right here in Cold Spring area, look, we have a mixture of savannas, some prairies, depending on the landscape, and not too far north and south of here, we got some areas of forested land, right? All those things are driving differences in the soils that you have under your feet. Next one's a sim simple one to think about, topography on the landscape, hills, they shape the type of soil you probably have observed in your own lives that you get rocky, gravelly soil at the top of the hill, those particles are really hard to move. They tend to accumulate at the top. Easy particles to move, the tiniest things are clay, they're microscopic. Rainwater will wash those down, so clay accumulates at the bottom of your landscape. So that gives way just how topography will do that. And this is a fun shot. This is that map you've seen before. This is called a digital elevation model. So if I took away all the roads and all the satellite and all the vegetation, just looked at topography and color coded, so the reds and the oranges that stand out there, those are the high elevations in our county. And the blues and the, and the greens there, that's the lower elevation. So you can see it, everything gradually kind of flows towards the Mississippi for the most part. We go from higher in the west to the north. Um, but another way to look at this is kind of interesting. If you could stand and slice the county in half and look at the landscape from kind of a side perspective down into the ground, what does that look like? This is a represent, representation of our, our basically our landscape in that pattern. So you can see there's the Mississippi River, the lowest point all the way over to the east, right? But then as you go west, you see we encounter those big hills, right? There's the Avon Hills. We got the big glacial uh, till area in the Sock Channel Lakes and through Spring Hill at Rosa. Deep soils there, and then go farther west into Bruton, it's deep soil as well. Notice over here that the bedrock is outlined at the bottom. They've got sedimentary rock material in the middle, that igneous rock. Anybody want to take a stab? What, which igneous rock do you think that might be that sticks up real close to St. Cloud near the surface? Granite. granite, yeah, so we got that granite name because that, that rock comes up real close, there's shallow soils over there, so that's easy for people to mine out of the ground. It's, it's not too deep as soils, you can get at it pretty easily. 
Now, that, that really pointy part right there, it's a little bit of fun trivia. Does anybody know the highest point in Stearns County? Oh, no. Oh, it's actually, Cliff, you're the first time I've done this presentation and got it almost spot on. If you want to find the highest point in all of Stearns County, yep, you got to go out to that Rancho Manana area. It's actually Collegeville Township, Section 20. Or if you know your bearings here, if you're on Big Watab Lake, if you're on the south side of Big Watab, you look at those hills due west of you. That's the highest elevation point in Stearns County. It's 1,460 feet above sea level, that hill is. And again, there's lots of, lots of big hills, but that, technically that is the highest point in all Stearns County right there. So if you're looking for that, then there you have it. A little bit of fun trivia for you. Uh, so forming factors, the other one is time. Um, so the only thing I want to highlight here when I talk about the other thing you're throwing in the recipe card, mixing up soils, is that because we had glaciers that came across our landscape, that made a young soil. That, that pushed out old soils and, and changed our soils that we have. So in the scheme of soils across the world, we kind of have a teenager uh, type soil. It's not real old. It's relatively young, uh, but still not very aged because, because of that glaciation. This is one point I always make too, is people, you think about losing your topsoil, this is why agronomists and soil scientists, we cringe at soil erosion because that, that top soil that you have in your landscape is the best, most fertile stuff you got. And please remember, it takes about 500 to 1,000 years to create a healthy inch of topsoil again. So when you lose it, it's gone in your lifetime. You're not getting that back unless you physically come in there and move it all back. Um, so that's an important reminder of how time plays into this. So, Again, we're making, we're building soil, right? So let's pump it into our machine here and let's mix it all up. Now let's see what kind of soils we get out. So this is the general soils map of Stearns County. And it's, it's blobs everywhere, right? It's diverse. We got a lot of mixture. And so what I want to highlight is some of the areas. Uh, you can't see the cursor. Um, off to the east, that bright yellow, the blues that you see there, and the darker greens coming west. Those are relatively poor soils. That superior lobe didn't give us a lot of great soils when it came down. Those are more sandy, rockier materials, not really great. But as you move west, there's a tip of yellow on the bottom south side of Stearns County there. There's a tip on the top. There's a blob of yellow around Albany there. And that light green into the center part of the county, those are fantastic soils. Those are wonderful, deep, rich soils, very fertile, really, really good for cropping. Excellent. Then you go to the blue out west again and you're into the Bonanza Valley area, that's sandy soils and you picked up that blue is a, is a different type of soil, that's a sandier material once again. So that outwash from the Des Moines mode. So again, kind of diversity, you got a lot of different soil, soils here in Stearns County. This is kind of why all these factors formed, it, formed together. We have this intersection of two glaciers, all these other crazy things happening that gave us all kinds of crazy soils across our landscape. <coughs> So then the next piece I was thinking about, I'm a, I'm a soil scientist, that was the easy part for me. I knew, I knew some of this stuff. But when I got into this talk and thinking about the history of it, I thought about, well, how did that, you know, we've, we have this long standing as being a top agricultural producer in the state. We have for a very, very long time. So how does, how does the soil kind of play into this picture? Or what, what were these people doing? These, where are some of the early farmers? Where were the farms? You know, what did they farm? What did they do? Where did they settle? Why they did? You know, and did the soil, do you think, play any role in the longevity or success they had? So one of the ways I went about this, you can go about this many ways, but an easy thing was at the History Museum, they, they keep track of century farms, right? So is everybody familiar with a, a, what a century farm is, right? Yeah. The same family for at least 100 years, you know? So you, you can designate yourself a century farm. So that's a pretty good indicator of a farm that's been around quite, quite a while, right? And, and at least been somewhat successful over that time period. Um, so, taking a look at Stearns County, you could, if you can make up, there's little red dots all over here. I, I can't bring that. This is the museum's uh, uh, map. I can't bring that one in. But if you can make out the little red dots, does anybody know how many, roughly how many century farms we have in Stearns County? Over 100. Oh, well over 100, yeah. And if you cheat, you can almost make out numbers on the map. But <laughs> we have 480 century farms as of 2018. 480. That's the most of any county in Minnesota. There's no other county that has that many century farms. So again, that's, this is a testament underlying, yes, we have been an agricultural powerhouse of a county for a very long period of time. We've got the most century farms on our landscape. So then I started exploring while well, thinking about these early settlers. Who, who were they? Where were they? The first folks to come in, at least some of these early century farms I looked into. Most of you are very familiar with the Miss Cold Spring group, I'm sure, with the Pure Hansen farm, right? In 1855, so that was settled in 1855. 
Up there is also near Wake Park, you got the Pattison Farm, same year, 1855. Those are some of the oldest ones of the Century Farm Archive at the museum. Uh, 1856 was a big year for the Century Farms. We had quite a few others. They got the Zumbold Farm out by South Richmond there, and the right north of town here, the Fuchs Farm, 1856. If you go on further west, you got the Felling Farm, uh, close to uh, Avon Albany there, the Schwinghammer Farm, 1856, and then way up, uh, there's a Getchell or Perry Farm up along the Mississippi River. Uh, next, 1857, you got the Cronenberg Farm down by St. Augusta, Promen Farm a year after that. The Meyer Farms pop up, if anybody knows the story of the Meyer brothers and their mother that settled on that landscape, didn't have like a nickel to their name when they landed, so they made everything out of, with their both their own hands and they you know used the last of their money put the shingles on the house okay. um, but that farm ended up being very successful out there um, fun all these actually have very fun stories the Lodemeyer farm is 1856 and Landwehr farm south of St. Cloud there is 1859 so I tried to focus on these 1850s kind of looking at these early settlers and what they were up to and just trying to spatially pick out where, where were they settling what was what was kind of the pattern here and so that's that's the ones basically through the oldest through the 1850s um, that you would find in the century farm data and I, I'm sure I'm probably preaching the choir when I talk about the Hanson Farm, but I just like to tell a few stories and look at this, you know, I, I enjoy the, the pictures especially, right, of these things. So, you know, the Pierre Hanson Farm, so, you know, around 1855, there's a picture here of the barn with the log walls and the sod roof. That was built, built by Michael Jr., you know, the son, and then eventually Michael Sr. came over, right? Um, joined him later, so the father and son started this farm and they operated it um, right over, you know, just where is it now, north of 23, you can see that farm place. Uh, this is a photo, this is um, Pierre Peter, son of Michael Jr. Um, this is again him on the farm in 1905 here in this photo. Have a good day, right? It's like a nice day. And here's some of you I'm sure are even familiar with, you remember Pierre Hansen. Um, so here's Pierre, uh, son of Harry, at age 14, uh, on the farm in 1935. So at that point, he was fifth generation on the, on the Hanson farm. Um, and I would point out, I don't have any pictures of Harry. I couldn't find any of him, per se. But he, his father, Pierre's father did a lot, when you read through this, this story and the narrative of their story, to update the farm. They did a lot with infrastructure. They had a new barn, the 1920 silos. They moved to tractor from horsepower to tractor power in the 1930s. That was pretty innovative for them. So they really did a lot of upgrades. And then Pierre was able to take over the farm um, and take advantage of some of that later on. There's a few more shots of that. The Hanson Farm folks there near Rockville hanging above and threshing on the right around 1940. Um, shift gears a little bit. We'll head back towards closer to where we are here, the Fuchs Farm. Now, I could get the original photo of... Um, Michael, who was the settler in this, uh, started the Fuchs farm there in 1856. But the first photo I've got in that file is, is John Fuchs. This is his son, so him and his bride. Um, he grew, John grew up at the farm just north of Cold Spring, and then he married um, his bride Mary here. And then they settled out, they went out west to uh, Lake George Township, and they ended up settling out there. Just a few more fun pictures. I, I enjoy the farm pictures very much. So this is a picture. I, now, this one doesn't have a lot of data with it. This is a Willenberg farm in 1900, so if somebody here can give the museum more information on specifics, go, go right ahead. This is a nice harvest dinner break, so you always hear the stories of the big harvest dinners where they, you know, the threshing crews would stop and all the big food, the big meals would come out, and so it's kind of fun to see everybody pitching in here. You got the, and the dog in the, in the foreground there. No. This, one, this one amazes me. I like this one. So this is uh, south of Willenberg farm in 1910. This is a wheat field, um, again, this is close to Richmond. And again, you're remembering this is human and horsepower. And look at the stacks of hay that go back off into the horizon. I mean, when I saw this photo, it was like my back hurt just looking at this photo. So I'm like, oh my gosh, you had blisters on your hands, but look at all that. I mean, it's amazing, right? And at the time and effort that that took to harvest a field that size, it's come a long way, hasn't it? I mean, it's amazing. Here's another uh, blonde. Blonigan and Goddard Farm. Uh, this one's close to uh, St. Martin area, around old farm place around 1910 again. And Maryland, here's, here's your shout out. Maryland's got the great article in the St. Cloud Times about this, and I was just fascinated when you think about coming here in this landscape and settling in this area. Remember I said the fort, we got a bunch of forested areas. I mean, I've tried to pull stumps out of my yard and tried to deal with a tree stump before, and I've got a chainsaw and other things. If you come here with an axe and a horse, horsepower, and you're trying to clear the land of all these forests, I mean, think about the undertaking and the work that does. I mean, it's it's amazing to think of these. This big draft in Maryland had a great article describing how this was. It was, was your father? Or, yeah, that was my father. Yeah, 
my father. That picture is of my father, but he did do that. But he did this, right? And he had that big contraption. I mean, it's just, that's and amazing. He how it was yeah, he explained how it was done. It's, I just uh, wowed by that because I know how much of a pain it is to pull one stump out, let alone clear a landscape of stumps. Oh. Um, so that brings me, so I got a few pictures of farms, but I wanted to say when I was digging in, thinking about what really dictated, you know, how they, why these people settled where they did, why were those farms there? Um, and obviously, hats go off to Father Francis Pierce. He drew a lot of settlers here. And we, we all know about Father Pierce and, and his exploits. I mean, he was wonderful on so many levels. But I think the interesting thing that um, at least picked up to me as someone who's a soil scientist and ground is thinking about agriculture, is you go back to, and read about Father Francis Pierce and where he grew up in Slovenia. He went out to the priesthood, he became a priest, he went into his first parish working with uh, a community in the mountain landscape. So these mountain landscapes in Slovenia, shallow, not very fertile soils, and the people were struggling in his parish. So he took it upon himself at the time to read up all these books on agriculture and horticulture and plant science and soils that he could. So he accumulated this and he read and read and read for years and he was helping his parishioners in that area make a better living out that rough landscape. That was a tough landscape to make an agricultural living on. And he took it upon himself to basically become self-taught agronomist. So that plays into this story. You know the rest, how he, he migrates from Slovenia up to the U.S., comes through the Great Lakes area, down you know, to where we are. And if you have an agronomist, or someone that knows something about that soil, look at this landscape, he's going to recognize what opportunities are here, right? I just told you about the wonderful soils we have. And so, in his writings, you re read back some of these things, talking about the excellent black, loamy soil, splendid mixture of sand and clay. He was, I mean, singing sweet music to any farmer right out there. I mean, he knew how to paint this picture, this beautiful picture of what was here. And he talked about a good, very favorable for farming and gardening is good. Um, snow and cold, when it's gone, you got lots of moisture in the springtime to plant those seeds into. Look at his description of the melons weighing 28 pounds, cabbages, 24 pound cabbages. I mean, he is just singing to my ears here talking about this landscape, right? And the potential. And of course, I mean, I don't know if any, uh, all the other priests would have seen that, but I mean, someone that knows what he's talking about with agronomy and soils, it really plays a role into how he can sell this, but not just sell, but recognize the value of this landscape and how important this is. And even when he did you know, convince a lot of those German settlers to come here, you know that story, they come here and they're settling on our landscape, and then there's this other excerpt in the file that talks about, you know, they took it upon themselves to leave Europe, come here, settle, and then they found difficulty growing some of the fruit trees and growing some of the things they were used to uh, back in the home, home motherland. So they were kind of grumbling. He said there's some grumbling amongst them. So Father Pierce took it upon himself then. Well, he sat down and, and he wrote this booklet to help them. It's called Ops Gardner, the Experienced Horticulturalist. And so he writes this booklet. And, and basically in it, it's got the, the description of everything from grafting trees, growing trees from seedlings, first year treatments, soils, winter conditions. He just writes out, I mean, and here's a resource that he knows what he's talking about with soils and agronomy to get everybody, not only here now, but now you got somebody to lean on that knows what they're talking about that can get you started. He, so he does this, he gives this great publication out to the early settlers, and so I think this is really a critical piece, again, in the success that we've got here in Stearns County as far as agriculture, when you go back in time. Not only did people come here, but he, he got them started. You know, he, he gave them a lift, he gave them knowledge and experience that he knew and how to do things on this landscape. And so I, I, when I look at this, and I was doing this project, I think you can't attribute the success almost anything more than Father Francis Pierce is kind of the number one thing that comes up when you're looking at all this stuff. Uh, so, and I know I'm, I'm not gonna go too long here, but I wanna, wanna share one last thing. When you look at the landscape, and so I was thinking again, uh, I was thinking about, well, how, how can you measure again the success of these farms? These people were doing really well and, you know, I, I took a look at that Century Farm map that, that the museum had, and then I flipped over to my soils map, and I looked at the soils. Remember I said that, that green in the middle, that yellow in the middle, north and south, and then I looked back. Oops. Go back to this. Now, do you see a pattern? If you can make out the dots on here, and I thought I was crazy at first. I'm biased. I'm a soil scientist. So I, I was thinking, well, I'm seeing the dots where those good soils are. And I said, well, I'm, I'm doing the research. So I asked the other museum, I asked uh, John and Steve, I said, come over here and look at this. I said, do you see you know, these groupings right here? Does that show up to you or is that, am I just losing my mind? And they said, no, they said that you're right. And so I, I haven't 
done any quantitative research, but uh, if you look at the groupings of farms here, and you go back to that soil map, this soil has played a role in the success of a lot of those farms, I think. There's a tight grouping where those good soils are. You've got a lot more century farms in that landscape. And it makes a lot of sense. If you've got drought conditions, if you've got flood conditions, if things, times are tough, you've got a good, rich, fertile soil resource to back you up and hold tough, it's going to hold your crop through better than some of the other soils around here, it was easier to get by year after year. You, you had a good, fertile, rich resource right in your landscape that you could rely on. So there's a lot of history going back to the soils probably did play a pretty, pretty good role as well as the, in the success and longevity of some of these farms. So, and with that, I'm going to thank the Strengths History Museum gave me a lot of help with the photos and research materials. My good wife does, does work there, so she knows, what, knows, knows exactly where to go. Um, I also give credit, uh, Brad Wentz, if anybody knows him, he's been a long time, he's near retirement at the Strengths uh, Soil and Water Conservation District. He's kind of a mentor of mine. I worked under him when I was uh, an undergrad at school near here. He's a soil scientist. He was on the original 1970 soil survey that was basically told us where these soils were, that soil map. He's an original creator of that. He still works today and knows these soils in this county like the back of his hand. He's an amazing guy. So I thank him for his help on this. And then Alan Knebel at the uh, Geological Society gave me some help with the glaciation stuff too. He's a wonderful resource. So i kind of give my shout out to that. And with that, I can make sure folks come up and take a look. Uh, the Germans, when you look at the uh, landscape here, I will put up this soil map. I, I, I like this soil map so much, I guess I brought it home and I put it in my desk. I thought it was at work, I was going to bring it for you today. But if you look at this soil map and you can look at this photo up here, uh, the Germans got a lot of the good soil here. So Father Francis Pierce knew where to have those folks settle in this landscape as well. There's a pretty good correlation with the light blue on the ethnicity map with those good soils up here uh, on the soil map. So anyway, that's one of my final takeaways. And again, if anybody has any questions, comments, yeah. Can you leave the uh, Century Farm map up for a few minutes to look at it? Yeah, come on up and take a look at the Century Farm map. If you want to look back at the soils map, I mean, all i got to do is flip the arrow back and forth and you can take a look at either one, but absolutely. Anything else? How many Century Farms did you say? 480, 480. 480. As of 2018, this summer. Jesse and the crew at the Strings County Museum just finished putting up the last signs of yeah, 480 went in. The stake went in this so. summer. Now, are they all active? That's maybe not true. They might have applied for Century Farm. They, they have a hard time keeping track of who's still a Century Farm and who's not. But several of those old ones are actually, right? The, the handsome one is, isn't and it? There's some that, as of now, right? Some that are 150 years. Oh, yeah. Like the handsome one. That's, I mean, that's way beyond 100. That's, yeah, we're talking beyond 150. Sesquicentennial farms, right? Yeah. I mean, so, yeah. And some of those are still active. Not Maybe not all of them, but, yeah. yeah. Was uh, one of the reasons, besides Father Pierce, was, you know, he wrote back to encourage people to come, mm -hmm. but they didn't have really their own farms in Germany, and that also encouraged them to come here because they could get a big piece mm -hmm. of land, right? And again, so they maybe had a hard time, so she, she asked about if, if they weren't farmers in, in Germany, per se, and they came here and they got some land. Once again, Father Francis Pierce again some guidance of these folks, right? And gave them that book, he published that booklet, and gave them, here's what to do, kind of a how-to guide, right? Of what to do on the landscape. So again, more more uh, blessings in one way or another, right? With him on the landscape and knowledge. He did stretch the facts. Yes, yes, never, I know, I know. He never told them about the 40-foot winter snowstorm. <laughs> <laughs> I know, he, he did paint a very, very pleasant picture. I know, I read those files and I'm like, gosh, I want to go live there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 100 degrees summers. Yeah. Is there any correlation with the Red River Trail then? Yeah, so the other thing that, uh, settlements that I found, and I, I forgot to highlight this because I'm short on time, but other things that correlate actually with those farms besides the soils and, and things like that, access to water, the river, and access to a wagon trail. And I think I've got, even I threw it in extra, here's that wagon trail map, the old wagon trail map. And you can see that a lot of those early settlements, you, you had to have one or the other two. Even more, probably more important than the soil. You found the good soil when you got to an area, you probably found the better soil to settle on, but you had to have that water access and you had to have the, the wagon trail, your route to get back to the civilization or settlements of some sort, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you go north, south, east, west from Stearns County, are the soil maps more uniform 
They, it depends. Yeah, there, Stearns County has got some of the most diversity in the state as far as soils. That is true. I wouldn't say uniform. Almost, I'm a soil scientist because I'm, I'm biased. I know this, but soils are very different across the landscape everywhere. But the degree of variation that we get in Stearns County is probably higher than almost all the other counties. Now, not many counties had the dual glacials at glaciers at the same time. Some, but not not many. Right. Good questions. Any questions? Did you learn something? I hope yeah. Oh, good. Very good.